Okay, wonderful. Well, again, like Becky said, my name is Morgan. I am the newest education specialist at Rookery Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve. Woo! Um, my contact info is at the bottom here if anyone has any questions following this program. Uh, but going through, uh, I noticed we have a chat box. Uh, so if you have questions that you want answered at the end, just throw those in there uh, and we'll get those answered uh, when we finish up here. So I'm going to go ahead and just jump right in. Today, I'm going to present to you Discover Rookery Bay, which is just a really great presentation that we give on behalf of Rookery Bay to show kind of who we are, how we came to be, and some of the great work that we do on a daily basis. So uh, I'm just going to go ahead and jump right in. So the first part to that is the who we are uh, part of that. And so we are so lucky to be a part of the NOAA group, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. That's our federal arm. So that allows us to be a part of this greater system of estuarine research reserves all across the continental US, including Alaska, Hawaii, and even Puerto Rico. So that's pretty cool. But by being affiliated with NOAA, there's been a certain level of standardization across these NERS, we call them, the National Estuarine Research Reserves, that you see highlighted on this map in red. We, of course, all share in the passion and the mission of protecting, educating, and managing these crucial estuarine areas across the country. But we also share in the same four core programs uh, at each of the reserves. And of course, the work is going to look a little different given the environment uh, in Alaska versus maybe here. <laughs> but it's still uh, a great feature to be a part of NOAA and share in that greater system nationwide. But if you are from Florida or in Florida right now, I want you to look a little closer. We are one of two states that has three national estuarine research reserves in our state. One on the Panhandle, one on the East Coast. And if you look at that red dot in southernmost Florida, that is us. That's Rookery Bay waving hello. But let's zoom in a little closer. So when we're talking about who we are, yes, we have NOAA as our federal partner but our state partner is the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. So the DEP umbrella actually is pretty big. Uh, so not only do they manage uh, the National Estuarine Research Reserve System, which we're a part of, they oversee the aquatic preserves, the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, the Coral Reef Conservation Program, and a small preserve, St. Joseph Bay State Buffer Preserve. But all of those coastal areas uh, combined make up 4 million acres of protected coastal areas statewide. I mean, if that number isn't jarring, I don't know what is. Uh, so we're a part of this greater national network, but we're also a part of this wonderful statewide network of protected coastal areas. So that kind of is Rookery Bay's makeup. We have a federal part, we have a state part, and uh, sometimes that can get a little confusing if you don't go through it. All right, so like I, like I promised, we're gonna go through a little bit of how we came to be. Uh, Rookery Bay's origins is a true grassroots come up. Uh, Rookery Bay was just a body of water at one point that no one really knew about, but I'm gonna go through just briefly how we went from just being that body of water all the way to being the National Estuarine Research Reserve that we are present day. So I'm gonna take you on a trip through time. We're going back to 1960. Hurricane Donna hit Southwest Florida pretty hard that year. And in the aftermath of that storm, there was a lot of buzz and a lot of attention coming to this area. And I think a lot of folks realized that there's a real opportunity here, whether it was to build their dream vacation home, to start their very own business, or even just a vacation and enjoy this beautiful, pristine area that they saw going through the news. So like Naples has always been, like Southwest Florida has always been, uh, growth is inevitable. And even in 1960, they saw this tremendous surge. The population of Collier County during the 1960s actually doubled. So when I say there was a lot of buzz, there was a lot, all right? And so folks were flocking here, trying to make their American dream a reality uh, and taking advantage of this beautiful place in one way or another. But there was a group of developers that might have taken it a little too far. And that's the reference to the right of my screen here. This is a map of what had become to be known the road to nowhere. This was a, pro a proposed development plan that a group of developers wanted to build going right through Rookery Bay. So 
I hope you all can see my cursor. This here is Rookery Bay proper, so the actual body of water in focus. And they wanted to build this road right from downtown Naples, oh, right through our beautiful barrier islands and our mangroves and out the other side. They want to do an island hopping highway, if you will. And man, did this put a thorn in the, the community side. A, a large group of concerned citizens in Collier County organized, began to fundraise with the school children and other citizens, and they were actually able to form the Collier County Conservancy. So after working with government officials in uh, Audubon, Florida, actually, the National Audubon Society, excuse me, they were able to initially buy that first 4,000 acres to protect and save Rookery Bay. And I will tell you, it is just the greatest success story. And there was this one tale from when they went to the city council meeting where the judge said, hey, uh, who wants this? To, who wants this road to be built? And obviously the developer said, me, me, me. And then they said, well, who opposes this project? And uh, the Collier County Conservancy folks rolled out a piece of receipt paper, basically a petition with all of these signatures from folks around the city and the county who didn't want this. And the receipt paper was as long as the aisle way. So I think that just spoke uh, to the conservation mindset that a lot of these citizens saw um, in Rookery Bay and saw the beauty of it far before uh, lots of others did. But actually I have a video here that is a beautiful outline of the history of Rookery Bay and can explain it much more efficiently than I could. Hopefully it loads for us. There we go. In the late 1960s, the Collier County Conservancy purchased over 2,500 acres of land surrounding Rookery Bay for conservation. The Conservancy turned this land over to the National Audubon Society to be turned into a nature preserve. It was a group of private citizens that ended up protecting it with a lot of partners, a lot of help, the Nature Conservancy, Audubon, a whole bunch of organizations came together to support the local people to protect Rookery Bay. Over a thousand residents and many local businesses and civic organizations donated to the Conservancy's campaign to save Rookery Bay. I mean, Audubon would not have had the money to go in had it not been for the fact that those people in Naples were willing to raise the money and make it work in terms of the land acquisition. And this was how Rookery Bay was saved. It became the nucleus uh, of Rookery Bay Sanctuary. Through the years, local citizens, school children, and civic organizations have banded together in support of protecting the scenic beauty of this region. What was once an Audubon sanctuary that protected around 4,000 acres is today a national estuarine research reserve that spans 110,000 acres. And through the efforts of grassroots conservation, through the 60s and up through today, we're actually able to have this place set aside so it'll be there in perpetuity, so generations of families can actually enjoy these resources and also use them as well. We always love showing these clips because they are from uh, the Mangrove Coast documentary that was made uh, all about Rookery Bay, so gives really good snapshots into uh, what we're talking about here today. So, like I said, we're on a trip through time. We went through the 1960s. We saw how Rookery Bay was saved. Now we're going into the 1970s where we really started tr to transition and Rookery Bay started to gain some traction. So um, if you're unfamiliar, the 1970s uh, were really the, the catalyst uh, into the environmental era. And there was so much environmental awareness across the country. It was basically at an all time high, and especially in Southwest Florida. So the Collier County Conservancy, was still working with the National Audubon Society, managing Rookery Bay Sanctuary that you can see on this map. 
And what they begin to do is acquire more land, acquire more area, more acreage. And it eventually became to a point where they thought we should, we should really transition this uh, for better management. And uh, that is when they decided to transition uh, basically the lease of the land to the Florida Department of Natural Resources. And that particular event really was uh, lending itself to the transformation of Rookery Bay into what it is today as a National Estuarine Research Reserve. And if you all didn't see it on the video or hear it, uh, our acreage is very large uh, in this day and age compared to what that initial 4,000 acres was. And I wanna show you our most recent map if it will load for me. Let's see. All right, here it is. This is the final product. So we just went through this trip through time. This is present day Rookery Bay. These are our boundaries here outlined in yellow. We are over 110,000 acres. That star on the map that you're seeing is our environmental learning center, uh, which is a great resource for a lot of visitors uh, coming into Southwest Florida to learn about us. But that has just been the, I think the greatest success story uh, that I've ever heard about Rookery Bay because it really started from the people uh, recognizing how great of a place this was uh, to protect and conserve. And that's gonna be where I transition into now is what is this place? I keep saying we're a National Estuarine Research Reserve, but for all of you who are wondering, what is an estuary? Well, that's what I'm here to tell you. Uh, so our main focus, our bread and butter at Rookery Bay is our estuary here. And an estuary is defined as a transitional zone where fresh, fresh water from the land meets salt water from the sea. So that's not always the case though, because I think if you saw that map of the whole nation uh, of estuarine research reserves, there are some on the Great Lakes. And I know Becky and I are like, what, a, an estuarine research reserve on Lake Erie, are you kidding me? Well, it's because a more general definition of an estuary is a place where two chemically different bodies of water meet and mix to create something new. So it, we always wanna say, don't go directly to the salt and freshwater mixing, but that is pretty much uh, the general definition for estuaries across the globe. And we love to highlight that estuaries look various uh, and very different in different locations. So that far left picture is our mangrove forest and estuary here in Southwest Florida. And we can see an estuary as a salt marsh in that middle photo and even a fjord in Alaska. So uh, they look completely different all across the nation, all across the world. But ours in Southwest Florida is indeed pretty special. And this is a, a better view of it. So if it's hard to imagine how this freshwater and saltwater would meet and mix, uh, this diagram on the bottom is showing the freshwater flowing through canals and tributaries across the land meeting in this middle zone or transitional zone where the salt water is pushed and pulled with the tide and it mixes with the fresh water. And that combination of salt and fresh water is actually called brackish water. So that brackish water is key in our estuary because it allows for a lot of great things to happen. And so we always ask, uh, if we were in person right now, I'd be polling the audience, hey, why do you think estuaries are important? Uh, and you can even put it in the chat if you want to take a couple guesses. But we always just say estuaries are so important for many reasons. Uh, but the first one that always comes to mind is that they are nurseries. Their tagline is that they're nurseries of the sea. And a lot of juvenile species of fish and other animals will use this as a refuge and uh, a place to grow up, right? That's what a nursery is, a place to grow up in protection. So it's a low energy system where a lot of food and a lot of habitat uh, is available to them. So it just provides a really great place uh, for a lot of animals that use our marine system to come in and use for at least part of their life. I think the statistic nowadays is over 80% of marine fish species will come into the estuary at some part of their life uh, to grow up. And I'm inclined to think that that number is even higher since the last time I checked. So. It just goes to show um, the importance of these beautiful places, these transitional zones uh, is not to be overlooked. And not only are they important for these animals, but they are productive uh, from the base of the food web. So our estuary here in Southwest Florida, our Rookery Bay estuary 
as seen by this picture, is a mangrove forested estuary. And we'll talk a little bit about mangroves in just a few minutes, but these mangroves are deciduous, so they lose their leaves all year long. And by doing so, they decompose and create this mud layer, this layer of organic matter and nutrients that explodes the food web. It allows for these, these producers and consumers to really come in and uh, establish these complex networks uh, and predatory relationships. And it's just, it's amazing to see just how productive our estuary is and nutrient dense, uh, we like to call it. Cause that brown water, it is not dirty, but it is nutrient dense. Uh, it's like estuary soup. <laughs> oh, and this is just one of my favorite slides because it couldn't be more true. Estuaries provide habitat for abundant wildlife. We see things like baby sea turtles, like you can see crawling down to the water in that bottom left corner. But we see things like beach nesting birds. We have birds that roost and nest in our mangrove rookery islands. We have seagrass beds that allow for manatees and other herbivores to thrive. And we even see some really cool endangered species as well. One of the most notorious is our small tooth sawfish and they use our back bay systems. But I just, I love to highlight the screen even just for a minute for you all to just get a really good look at what rookery bay can sustain, what animals can use it, whether it's just for a part of their life, whether it's year round, uh, and how much habitat there really is to be had. And the two habitats we'd like to emphasize are mangroves and oysters. Uh, one, because they're the most abundant, and two, because they're just so instrumental in the success of our estuary. And that's when I'm gonna talk about our mangroves. So our mangroves are really cool because they are a tree that can survive being submerged underwater for lengthy periods of time because of the tide. So if you were to go back home and say, mom, I'm gonna plant my tomato plant in the bathtub. She would say, you're crazy because it would drown. It's not, it's not suited for that kind of environment. Well, these mangrove trees can handle inundation and being flooded at the root system. And most notoriously, I think we're all thinking, oh, this is the red mangrove because red mangroves have those prop roots that hold the tree itself out of the water and can handle that tidal flux. But we also have black mangroves and white mangroves here in Southwest Florida. We're kind of the northernmost range for these mangrove trees because although there are 80 species worldwide, uh, our three species here in Southwest Florida are actually genetically different, completely different. They have no similarities other than they share the characteristics of being able to survive being inundated for certain amounts of time. So when we think of mangroves, we think of the red and you can see this beautiful half shot of underwater and then even in the canopy there. We'd love to talk about it as a perfect habitat for not only fish when the tide is high and other cool critters that hang out in the estuary, but even in the canopy, we, we did mention birds coming to roost and nest there and even some other small mammals and insects. And it's just such a great host for uh, hundreds of different animals, literally uh, at any given time of year. So that's why we love to emphasize mangroves. That is our, that is our thing here at Rookery Bay. And we do a lot of research on mangroves as well. And our second uh, habitat that we really like to focus on is oysters. And I think it's really cool because when we teach these, these lessons to students in our field trips, it's a hard concept to grasp to think of an animal as not only an animal, but also as a habitat. Uh, but it's cool because oysters will begin their life as plankton. So if you see this bottom picture here, this is a larval plankton of uh, an oyster and it drifts through the water. And eventually when it begins to develop, it's gonna need a place to settle onto. And oftentimes in our estuary, that is other oysters. And that's how we get these beautiful oyster bars and oyster reefs. So you can see this bottom right picture. We've got some beautiful Eastern oyster catchers taking advantage of our oyster bars at a low tide. Some other animals, some cool critters that work their way into the nooks and crannies. We see a mud crab, we see some worms and some barnacles, and I bet a ton of other critters that we can't even find because there's so many great places to hide. But we talk about mangroves and oysters in conjunction because they work together. So this picture here is one of my favorites. We see mangroves growing out of our oyster beds. This is a red mangrove sprout. 
and they have these things called propagules. And mangrove trees basically give live birth. They are not seeds. Uh, this propagule that looks like a green bean, I wish I had one, it floats around in our estuary until it finds a really great place to settle onto, kind of like our oysters. But once it gets rooted in this hard substrate, then it begins to build and, and produce its prop roots. And once they become locked in, it's like cement, all right? I mean, they work together so well, they anchor each other. And when we have storms or even uh, hurricanes, when we have these mangrove islands built upon this really hard surface, it's the best buffer you could ask for um, in a coastal area that is. So this is a great representation of, of that phenomenon happening, but they just put it in a tank so you could see it. So you see the waves coming in and you can see the oysters and the mangroves. And by the time it gets out to the other side, which would essentially be like our coastline, uh, it's calm. There's no disturbance, and it would really protect a lot, a lot of things and people. Um, and we always say an estuary without oysters and mangroves would be uh, a sad one, but that's just because that's what we focus on so heavily here at Rookery Bay, and that's what we rely on as a coastal area because, woo, without these, we would be in a whole lot of trouble. Now flipping the switch a little bit, we just talked a little bit about the habitats and some of the animals that use them. Well, you're seeing a great example uh, of why this should be a protected area, not only because of the natural beauty and the persistence of a lot of species, but it's important for us as well. The marine economy is so crucial here in Florida uh, for both the fishing and seafood industry, as well as recreation. So all those times you wanna go out on a fishing charter or go out and try to drop a line with your grandson, well, if we don't protect these estuaries, there might not be fish to catch uh, or crabs to harvest. So we really need to be persistent in our, our efforts. Um, because like I said, a lot of fish species use the estuary for some part of their life. And you know, you don't wanna assume things, but if it was not there, there would be a real gap or a real uh, disadvantage for that species because they'd have to find another way to live um, and go through that life stage. But also recreation. I know I love to kayak. I love to boat. Um, folks love to go to the beach. They love to explore. So recreation is a huge part of our marine economy. And we are so grateful that our area is beautiful and uh, can sustain that. But we want to keep it up. That's the key. And that's how we're going to do it. So our mission and our vision is how we're going to really keep on uh, persisting in this quest to protect Rookery Bay and the surrounding coastal area. And our mission is to serve Southwest Florida as a trusted resource for science-based information to foster connected human and ecological communities. So we want people to connect with this place. That's our, our kind of tagline. We say Rookery Bay is yours to explore because we want you to get in and explore it for yourself and appreciate it. And in our mission, we want to see the outcome of communities in Southwest Florida valuing nature and prospering in concert with healthy estuaries. That's what we want to see. And the only way we're going to get there is to be a trusted science-based resource. So that is what we've been doing. That's what we're going to continue to do uh, and hopefully see this through. And we can't do it alone. We have so many partners. I'll let you digest this slide because it's crazy. Uh, but some of the most notable are, of course, NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, and DEP, Florida Department of Environmental Protection. They oversee us, right? So they are amazing partners and great guidance. But we also have a friends group, the Friends of Rookery Bay, who supports uh, the reserve in many, many ways. As well as some universities, we see Florida Fish and Wildlife, even Red Bull. Some of these might be surprising to you, uh, but we do have a lot of partners spanning far and wide. And even FIU, uh, if you're unfamiliar, Florida International University over in Miami, uh, financially supports the salaries of about a third of our staff. So they are a phenomenal partner and have really opened the door uh, for further conservation of this area. But I wanna take you back to talk about the Friends Group. So our Friends of Rookery Bay is our 501c3 nonprofit and they support the reserve not only in outreach but advocacy, fundraising and volunteerism. And they have their own mission, which basically is to be the backbone of the reserve. They wanna support us by connecting people to Southwest Florida's coastal environment. And they can do that in a variety of ways. 
they advocate for us on a government level. So they are our voice. They can lobby for us and really get with the stakeholders to, to make the right decisions and connect them with our coastal environment. They have partnered with our exclusive eco tour provider, Rising Tide Explorers, to provide boat and kayak tours in our estuary. And I will tell you all, if you haven't been on a tour yet, you're missing out. Uh, if you go to our website, rookerybay.org, you can book a tour and they are phenomenal. Uh, all biologists led, most of them have their masters in some sort of conservation area and it is just a blast. Uh, they really know how to make it a great family fun experience. Arts in the environment, man, the Friends of Mercury Bay in a regular year uh, would host art shows and art gallery showings uh, that connected people to this area in just a different way. So yes, if a boat tour is not your thing and you're into art, well, we've got that for you too. And the Friends have done a great job of highlighting that. And their staff is just so helpful. Uh, that's what they're there for. They're, they're our customer service representatives. They do outreach with us. They volunteer. Uh, they are just all across the board in support of Rookery Bay, and we couldn't do it without them. And of course, uh, our communication and our website is all through our friends group, and that's how we communicate with all of you uh, and the public. So without that and our e-newsletter, uh, we might not be getting the word out as great as we could. So the friends group really does uh, give the, the structure and support uh, to the reserve that we need because, gosh, we know budgets are tight. So uh, the friends group really does a great job in helping us along. And it is not just the friends group that makes everything possible. It is our volunteers. Uh, the reserve only has a little bit less than 40 full-time staff. Um, and that's not including interns, but we have 110,000 acres to manage and protect. Uh, and 40 people is not going to cut it. <laughs> Surprise, I'm going to blow your mind. So we have hundreds of volunteers that are dedicated and so loyal that help us in every facet of operation. They go out and do outreach for us like T-Motion does to our barrier island beaches. We have education volunteers that help us with our programming. We do programs for the public and we have great volunteers that, that allow people to come in and feel welcome, as well as maintenance volunteers, which it sounds hokey pokey, but we have to manage, we gotta do a land management. Uh, these volunteers are amazing and we couldn't do it without them. And even if it's something as simple as fixing a doorknob, uh, you wouldn't believe the impact it makes to the reserve as a whole because everyone's allowed to continue on, continue with their work, and uh, these folks are really contributing. So we could not be any more lucky uh, for all these folks pictured here and beyond, because like I said, we've got hundreds. And now I'm just gonna wrap up our presentation today with a little description of our four core programs. So we'll talk a little bit about our research, the stewardship going on, education and coastal training, and then we'll be ready to take questions. But before we get into that, our research at Rookery Bay is very instrumental because it's in our name, we're a research reserve. And we always start with water quality monitoring because what's going on in the water will tell you almost everything else you need to know that's going on in the estuary. It's so important. Uh, and when we go out to do these water quality monitoring, our water quality manager, Julie, who's pictured here, has data sons set up all within the estuary. There's five. Uh, and sometimes she has to go out and manually download the data which she collects things like salinity or how salty the water is, dissolved oxygen levels, turbidity, which is the amount of uh, suspended sediment in the water, and a bunch of others, temperature, you name it. And when we collect that data, we upload it and we're able to share it. So if there was ever a time where there was an event, let's say a hurricane, and we said, wow, what were the conditions before, during, or after that hurricane? we can go back to our data loggers and find that information. And when the aftermath comes along, we can say, wow, the dissolved oxygen level is so low. That's why we weren't seeing this species or that species. Or it gives a lot of reason to things that are happening in the estuary is in the water quality monitoring. And it direct, directly affects some of our other research, which is our fisheries monitoring. And our fisheries biologist pictured below it, he studies uh, juvenile fish populations in the 10,000 islands, uh, including everything from small bay fish uh, all the way up to juvenile sharks, because yes, sharks are fish. 
And he's looking at the hydrologic changes in our estuary and how that affects the different species. So like I said, if there was a parameter, and in this case, it's fresh water, if there's too much of it, what species can handle it? What species don't like it? Who's gonna be present? Who's gonna be absent? Uh, it's a really great monitoring effort that's been going on for just about 20 years. Um, so he has been persistent in his quest <laughs> to uh, collect this data. We also do a great deal of avian monitoring. So Rookery Bay got its name for uh, all of the birds that hang out here. Uh, a rookery is a place where birds can gather uh, or animals more generally, but in our case, it's birds. So we are lucky enough to have an avian ecologist on staff full time doing our monitoring. And again, we use volunteers oftentimes because there's so many birds to be looked at and counted. Um, we go to our Barry Island beaches uh, for our nesting shorebirds and our bird rookeries. Uh, we check those out as well. And oftentimes we look within our critical wildlife areas too. So uh, these are marked off places within the reserve that you cannot land or go within the boundary uh, because it would disturb the processes that these birds are going through, whether they're on migration, whether they're nesting, uh, you name it. But our avian ecologist uh, monitors all of that. And not only do they just go out and monitor using binoculars and scopes, uh, they do banding. They uh, have a pretty good bird banding effort, as well as we have a modus tower. And a modus tower is really neat because it tracks nano chips placed in birds and other small insects and invertebrates uh, to basically ping wherever there's a modus tower. And when you're tracking a migratory bird that was tagged, let's say in Alaska, and it pings in Southwest Florida, we're able to learn about that bird's migratory patterns, that bird's life, I mean, it is just, it's unbelievable. So we're lucky to have a modus tower and um, Cole, who's our avian ecologist is so great. And um, we can give you some resources on how to find more information about that because they're all over the country. And uh, we really are learning a whole lot about birds through this process. We also have a GIS specialist on our research team. And basically our GIS specialist does everything. <laughs> she wears many hats. Uh, but she uses her mapping uh, to assist almost every other research group at the reserve. So she uses it to help for stewardship and prescribed buyers. And then in this case that we're showing you is our sea turtle monitoring program. So she is able to map out very precisely, uh, first of all, the landscape of what the beach looks like that year, but then also plotting the points of where the nests are, where the false crawls are, and make this data accessible to the public uh, through our website. So the bottom here is a screenshot of our website last summer uh, using the data that our GIS specialist has been able to input and then produce. So uh, I think she is just so instrumental in our success and we could not keep such good eyes on the reserve without her drone skills either. <laughs> so we're grateful to have her around. All right, so to wrap up research, we call ourselves a living laboratory and we invite researchers from all over the world to come and do their research within the reserve boundaries. Uh, they would be hosted, they could stay at our dorms, but our collaborative research efforts are extensive and it is just so cool to meet these researchers from all over and hear about their experience and why they're doing their research in such a unique place uh, as Rookery Bay. So we really love uh, collaborating with those folks. And we also do mentor, intern mentoring programs, which uh, the most notorious is our sea turtle intern. And they get skills from boat driving to GIS inputting, uh, data processing, all of the good stuff. So research here at Rookery Bay is uh, it's pretty robust and we've got some great programs going. Flipping over to our second core program of stewardship. Uh, this picture is always so cool. I love using it. Uh, Rookery Bay's land management team or stewardship team uh, does just that. They manage our uplands and they keep the reserve uh, as pristine as possible. So the first thing that they do that's so utterly important is prescribed fire management. And for some folks who aren't familiar with prescribed fire, you would think, well, why would we start a fire if we don't want a wildfire? But really there's some sense to it. There's a science to it. And if you let too much debris accumulate, in these hammock areas, then it is more likely to ignite in, an, in a natural way and cause more damage. Uh, but these 
these coastal communities have burn cycles. So they're resilient and they're accustomed to burning every couple of years, usually two to five. And uh, it's one of those things where our team will go out and they'll assess these different plots and they'll set the burn and they'll have a prescription that is very, very detailed and specific based on weather and wind. And this team is just so hardworking and experts in their field because it takes an army to successfully burn uh, one of these plots within the reserve. And I'm sure maybe you've seen some smoke <laughs> billowing uh, from Mercury Bay lately because we've been doing a handful of burns. Um, but this is one of probably the coolest things that our stewardship team does. And it is really important uh, not only to get these coastal communities in their burn cycles, but it's in order to control and protect uh, native biodiversity. So a lot of these native plants are accustomed and resilient to burning. But let's say you have an exotic plant or an invasive plant that's causing problems and you do a prescribed burn in an area, more often than not, that plant's not gonna be resilient enough to survive. So that's a really good way to, to protect our native biodiversity in our plant communities. But our stewardship team or land management team also works with partners like the Conservancy of Southwest Florida to do python control, uh, which is an exotic invasive um, snake, if you didn't know. But I think everyone knows here in Southwest Florida, the pythons are a problem. But we work with them closely uh, to eradicate the species in the best way possible. They do a tracking method. Uh, it's really neat, but our team is trained and uh, they go out there and help them do that because a reserve without native biodiversity might not look the same uh, as it might uh, transition into if that problem's not taken care of. So in the last part of stewardship that I always think is so fun and folks don't really think about is our cultural resource management. Uh, our area has been inhabited by the Calusas, then transitioning into the pioneers, and then obviously us today in present times. But the artifacts that are within the Rookery Bay boundaries are extensive and there's always more to be found and cataloged. So our resource manager here um, who deals with the cultural side of things is so uh, amazing for being really uh, committed to finding these artifacts, cataloging them properly. And it's not just Rookery Bay history that we're cataloging, this is Southwest Florida history. Uh, and we're only contributing to the bigger story by doing this and staying diligent. So this is a really cool part of our stewardship department that a lot of folks might not know about. And this is a great little video again uh, from our Mangrove Coast documentary talking about stewardship at Rookery Bay. The stewardship sector at Rookery Bay has a critical role in translating science to management. So you're doing the science related things and then you're doing those kind of just down in the dirt kinds of things. Invasive species control, prescribed fire, and restoration are ways that resource managers work to protect habitat and sustain native biodiversity. Rookery Bay Stewardship Team partners with other organizations to help remove invasive species. The Rookery Bay Stewardship Sector also works to remove invasive plants so native species can flourish. Likewise, when we do exotic plant control, what we're doing is we're really trying to restore the ecosystem. Prescribed fire is one way to control invasive plants, but it has many other benefits. Many native plants are dependent on fire. And what the stewardship team does is they try to mimic natural patterns in Florida ecosystems. Another way Rookery Bay works to foster a healthy ecosystem is through hydrologic restoration. All these efforts, from exotic species removal, to prescribed burns, to restoration, work to create a healthy ecosystem. It sure does. Uh, and we always love to add that clip because it summarizes it so beautifully. Um, 
All right, now we're on to our third core program, which is our coastal training program. And the simplest way to put this uh, is that our coastal training program bridges the gap between scientists and professionals who make management decisions. And the way I think of it uh, in my own head is they're educators for a professional audience uh, and stakeholders. So they train government professionals, they do webinars and workshops, they facilitate collaboration processes between businesses and the government, and they educate policymakers uh, on issues and topics that might be relevant to them in their decision making. And again, I've got a perfect video here uh, to describe it for you all. And it gives uh, a good insight to some of the programs that they offer in a good, a good typical year. Um, so let's see if this will go for us. The wildly successful coastal training program for the NERS system was begun at Rookery Bay, and so it's had a tremendous impact on the entire system. The coastal training program helps us with translating that science into actionable management. We are providing science-based information, training, and tools. Anybody who really has the ability to make decisions that are affecting kind of a landscape scale. CTP trains law enforcement officers from Fish and Wildlife Commission and other agencies whose work impacts the estuary. If you have a law enforcement officer who is more educated on what the rules are, then they're actually able to take that into action. They can actually go out there and they can actually do a better job of help protecting these areas. CTP provides workshops for civic leaders on hurricane preparedness. We're working on coastal resiliency now, topics about sea level rise and hurricanes, and helping our community leaders and those decision makers get the knowledge they need to prepare our communities to be able to bounce back from things like a hurricane. And CTP works to train landscapers as well as a partnership between the Florida Department of Environmental Protection and local stakeholders, Project Greenscape is a program to train landscapers in conservation methods to reduce the impact of landscaping on the estuary. What we want to do is educate those landscapers so that they're putting out the right amounts of fertilizer at the right time of year so the fertilizer stays in their lawns, not running off into our watershed, into our ecosystem. All right, and we are gonna wrap it up uh, with my favorite department, our favorite core program, of course, uh, education. So like I said, coastal training is more education for a professional audience. Uh, here in our education department, we do K to gray. Uh, we do a public audience. We have field trips for school students of varying ages, but our field experiences in a typical year would look like in-person field trips for fourth, seventh, and high school students. Uh, as well as some public experiences, but we have really taken the bull by the horns uh, during this virtual time and we've transitioned a lot of our programs into virtual field experiences. The most notable is our excursions. So we'll have uh, some resources on the next slide, I believe, uh, to go to our website and uh, to check that out because they are really cool. And you can see the estuary right from the comfort of your own home with our education team. We also in a normal year would offer a lot of workshops and lectures, uh, whether it be photography workshops or art classes or lunch and learns. Uh, we love to engage the public on a variety of platforms that they're comfortable with. And lastly, we do a ton of community outreach, which is why I'm here talking to you all today. Uh, we love to get out in our community and spread the good news about Rookery Bay and just how much they can explore and experience by coming to see us. which uh, if the students were able to come this year to Rookery Bay, they would of course have had a great experience, but we've really pivoted. And I just put this slide in here because I wanna highlight the success of our virtual field trip programs. We reached over 2,300 students, uh, which is more than double that we normally do in a given year uh, across all of our programs. 
And that was just done with our survivors program, which is our seventh grade program and our fourth grade program, Estuary Explorers. So we took uh, all the resources we could, we learned a lot and we were able to reach students virtually that even in a normal year could never come see us uh, just because of distance and restrictions. So we were just so proud of this and I had to throw it in there because yes, that is our team on the cover of Naples Daily News. <laughs> But it is, it just speaks to the, um, the level of adaptability that we've uh, overcome in this time. And of course, if this presentation was so uh, exciting to you and you are just dying to come see us at Rookery Bay, I'm so sorry. Uh, our Environmental Learning Center is currently closed to the public, but that does not mean you cannot book a boat or kayak tour into our estuary. Uh, and you can do that by going to rookerybay.org. I highly recommend it. There's just no better way to experience it. Um, if you can't go to our learning center, this is the second best, uh, getting out in the estuary and getting your feet wet for yourself. And some upcoming events and programs, like I said, boat and kayak tours, always a great, great way to go about it. If you're a birder, check out our virtual binoculars. It's a virtual birding lecture with our specialists, our excursions, our live field trips uh, stream to you virtually from your home. And then we're even doing a family camp out, nice socially distanced in the green space of our parking lot. So. All of these and all the registration can be found on our website, rookerybay.org. And I just love to end it with uh, saying that Rookery Bay is yours to explore. And we hope that just by this presentation, you can uh, appreciate where you're from or where you visit a little bit more, learn a little bit and get out there to see it and appreciate it for yourself. So uh, I'm going to end with this. I thank you all for having me and I can take some questions. I believe we've got a couple minutes. So uh, I'm ready when you all are. Well, thank you uh, so much for having me and thank you everybody for watching. Um, it was great to interact with you all this morning.